Hi, good morning, everyone. Can everyone see and hear us? If you can, it'd be super if you could just uh, write in the chat box. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And what we have today is a presentation on environmental justice in urban and community forestry. I'm going to give a little caveat that we have had some issues with tech this morning. So if you're having problems, please, please, please write it so that we can try to work this out. Apologize. Give me just one second. Okay. All right. So, again, I apologize. We've had some tech issues, but here we are. So, my name is Chris Lepicu. I am an urban planner and I'm also an arborist. We're also joined by Francis Wade who's registered forester and the program head of the South Carolina Forestry Commission Urban and Community Forestry Program. We're excited also to have today, we have Lau Sharp, who is also with the South Carolina Forestry Commission. And we have Steve Patterson with the Center for Airs Property Protection and Keisha Long with the South Carolina Department of Health and Environment. Before we get going, what I wanted to do is do some housekeeping. I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows how to use the platform. We are going to use polls for this event. What I'm going to do is open the polls just as soon as we go housekeeping. If you look on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you'll see polls. If you click on that, there actually should be one open now. If you can answer that, that would help us. And we'll open them more throughout the week. Second, we have a question and answer function, and that's in the ask a question button, also in the bottom right hand corner. We would appreciate that if you could use that for uh, content questions. If you have a question about one of the presenters, a specific topic on something they're speaking about, that'd be great if you could post that there. Next, I know that a bunch of people have already used the chat function. That's great. Please feel free to say hi. Please feel free to say I'm having problems with seeing, hearing, and allow us to do the best he can to try to help you work through any technical issues. Now, I'm going to pass it over to Francis Waite, who's going to do a quick thank you. Yes, thanks, everybody, for um, being here. Sorry about the echo. We're, we're working on that. Um, I just wanted to let you know that this webinar series is supported by a grant from the U.S. Forest Service to the South Carolina Forestry Commission Urban and Community Forestry Program. Um, I'm the coordinator um, for the South Carolina Forestry Commission for the Urban and Community Forestry Program, and we're partnering with Plan Green today to provide today's webinar, and I want to welcome you all to our Planning Commissioner webinar series to give commissioners and advisory board members the tools to help you when you're having discussion, re discussions regarding trees and urban forests. Our speakers today are from DHEC and the Center for Air's Property, and they're going to discuss environmental justice, ensuring common benefits for all, and giving you some ideas and concepts to consider in your decision-making process. And um, thank you for participating today, and without your continuing interest and support, we wouldn't be able to provide this programming, so we appreciate you. And so today's agenda, um, we've got Keisha Long from um, DHEC, She's the environmental justice coordinator. And we also have Steve Patterson, who's going to go first. He's the director of uh, uh, forestry services leadership team in the Center for Air's property preservation. And after their presentations, we're going to have um, some a question and answer period. So, um, And so we uh, have the urban and community forestry program. And our goal is to help foster support and enhance long-term sustainable urban and community forestry programs within communities, and we provide technical, educational, and financial assistance primarily to cities and towns and nonprofit organizations and state and county government. My name is Chris Lepidu, and I'm with Plan Green. Plan Green, we work with local communities, governments, lands trusts, 
developers to help generate community-led solutions that improve the quality of life throughout small, medium, and large communities. I know this is important to a lot of folks, so I'm going to over it. If you need credit for this session, um, we are offering SCPEAC, which is the Planning Commission Credits. We also are offering ISA. Please email your ISA number, name, uh, and if you need planner credit, AICP, you can do the same. Email me. I can walk you through the process of how you can log your own credit on the website if you need help with that. Uh, so what I want to do now is freeze. So right now we're in session one. This is on environmental justice and urban forestry, urban energy forestry. Um, our next session is going to be on September 8th. It's also a Thursday at 11 a.m. We're going to be talking about urban forestry how they benefit food security. And our last session is going to be on October 13th at 11 a.m. Also on Thursday, we're going to have a guest speaker, Dr. David Cohen. He's going to talk about invasive species, how they affect urban forest, forest system. Now I'm going to pass it back to talk about the public. Did you give that back to me, Chris? Because I couldn't hear you very well. I did. Okay, I just want to make sure. Um, um, I wanted to thank um, everybody for, for being here, and I wanted to also tell you about some opportunities that the Forestry Commission has coming up. We have an ISA certified workshop. It's a two-day prep class, August 30th and 31st, 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. at Saluda Shoals Park, and that is um, in Irmo. The cost is $100. And we also have um, grants for municipalities um, workshop coming up a webinar on October the 12th is just one hour and it um, lets uh, these communities know how to apply for grants to get some more data on their urban forest and kind of how to manage them and work towards getting some urban forest management plans and we also have um, healthy trees healthy lives videos that we completed they're on our website and um, they're dealing with um, getting people out and active and and being healthy um, South Carolina is, I guess, number 41 as far as healthy states being the least healthy states. So um, I guess we have a lot of work to do there and encourage people to get out there and exercise in, in the um, forest and in, in, among the urban forest. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. I'm going to pass it over to Steve. Yep, we all see you green. You're good to go. And I can hear you. Thank you very much. Hmm? Here to tell you a little bit about what we do at the Center for Airs Property Preservation. And uh, I thank you for that. It's, it's a little strange with our technical difficulties not being able to hear, I guess. My wife probably says, I told you so. This is this is uh, how she probably thinks I view the world where I can't hear any any uh, any other voices. But anyway, I really do appreciate the chance to be here and kind of walk through what we do at the center. And um, we'll get started, I guess. Let me see here. Hopefully. You can see my screen OK and you can hear me. Um, just one, welcome to the Center for Airs Property Preservation. This is our group, mostly pre uh, pleasant, uh, 37 of us, uh, a mixture of attorneys and foresters and admin people, outreach. And uh, this, is, this is who we are. And um, as it says in the bottom, land's the most important asset for people. And we'll tell you a little bit what we do to protect uh, people and do sustainable uh, sustainable land use. Our, our mission of the center is to, um, you know, protect heirs property and promote sustainable use of the land to help our landowners, uh, you know, generate income, generational wealth, basically, so that they can keep the land in the family.
not sure who can, uh, who knows about Ayers property. Many of you probably do. Uh, some people have a misconception of, often when they hear Ayers property, they just think it's family land and there's an actual legal definition. And in one of the disclaimers, the attorneys in our group always make the rest of us say when we're out there, we're not attorneys. So anything that we say is, is uh, not legally binding. But anyway, it's property that's owned by the heirs of a deceased person. Uh, the property has been passed down without a will. Uh, it's property that was not properly probated in court, property that was owned by multiple family members who own an interest or share in the property. When, when we actually make presentations, and that's kind of what, what we do a lot of times in our outreach efforts, we go to churches or areas where, uh, you know, heirs, property, landowners will probably be, and we, we give a seminar in which a, an attorney talks and then a forester talks about the services that we can provide. The attorneys usually provide, you know, this is one of the slides that, that they will use. Um, that we're there in a handout actually, because a lot of times we, we're not doing PowerPoints, but uh, just showing what Ayers property is and, and how it, you know, the analogy to a pie, uh, you know, where the ownership's a tendency in common and, uh, you know, the Ayers property is kind of like a pie in that um, all the heirs have some interest or share in the pie, but the pie hasn't been sliced yet. So not everyone gets to use or enjoy the whole pie. So even though there may be five heirs that own 10 acres, it's not like each of them has two acres. They all are involved in the whole pie. And so they, they can do things in common on the, on the grounds, in this case, like family reunions, fish hunt, do things like that. And then uh, the note they have at the bottom, they're all supposedly responsible for paying taxes. But uh, in real life, that often does not happen where it's usually one person kind of keeps things going. The problems that this can can cause, uh, one, the liability that becomes the land is more a liability than it is an asset. As the saying goes, make the land work for you rather than you working for the land. You should be able to do more than just pay taxes from your land. Uh, some of the other problems with having your the, the land in this kind of uh, risky, unstable form of ownership uh, you can see there uh, you can't really use the asset like like you would want to if you had clear title. So there's a number of issues with that. You know, predatory development is is one where, uh, you know, some somebody gets a hold, you know, a, a land. One of the heirs sells their rights to the property and, and then you have somebody becoming a member of the family in a way. And then uh, in the past, particularly things are changing a little bit, thank goodness, but where they can force uh, a sale of that property. The center, the center's history, just briefly, it, it uh, started as outgrowth of the Coastal Conservation Foundation in 2002, it became its own nonprofit in 2005. Uh, Dr. Jenny Stevens, whose picture is shown here, she's She's been with the organization the whole time. She's done a wonderful job of, of helping the organization grow and, and serve uh, landowners. Um, in 2013 is when the forestry component of the center, it was initially, a, it started as a legal services organization in 2013 uh, when it was realized that uh, a lot of our landowners who were getting their titles cleared um, they really didn't know what to do with their, their land. They weren't making good use of it. Uh, we received funding from the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, the NRCS and the U.S. Forest Service and launched the Sustainable Forestry and African-American Land Retention Pilot Project. Had uh, three states were involved, North Carolina, Alabama and South Carolina. In South Carolina, we were the pilot site. Uh, we started with 40, 40 families just to to see what the benefits of education and providing legal services and forestry technical assistance would be for landowners. It was very successful and we saw the need. And so we've grown ever since. Uh, okay, I guess I went ahead, but in 2001 now, we started with just a few counties around South Carolina. I mean, just like 
four or five counties right around the Charleston area. We're now up to 22 counties where we, we can provide services. Um, we talk about our work in the terms of three buckets, prevention, resolution, and land utilization. Uh, as far as prevention, uh, this is, is trying to keep land from getting into heirs' property, becoming heirs' property, and this includes like probating estates. Education is critical in everything that we do. Uh, we provide free will clinics, you know, draft simple wills for free for landowners, and then we help with estate planning. That's from the kind of the legal side, the prevention, and also from the legal side is the next, next bucket of work, which is the resolution. So people that have heirs property help them to get out of that situation to resolve their titles. Um, and that involves um, often, uh, you know, creating the family tree, uh, you know, defining, defining all the heirs, which can be a very complicated process. Uh, we provide direct, direct legal services. And, um, and also we do a lot of family presentations because uh, a lot of the issues are resolved because family, family members don't necessarily agree on what to do with the land. And that be, that's a, a huge issue. And uh, when we work with somebody from the legal standpoint, uh, it's pretty much one of the contingencies is that the family will work to, towards agreement because they, uh, you know, they don't want to go into a, a, any to a court and not have agreement because that that will not end well, cannot end well. And then finally, the land utilization bucket, which I'm involved in more, is um, just helping families, um, you know, understand what their land's worth and how the, the sustainable use of their land can benefit the family. A lot of it is involves, you know, giving them a financial incentive to keep the land in the family. And, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute, but we provide technical assistance. Um, we, we, we partner with uh, agencies like the Forestry Commission in the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And then we also, education again is a critical part of what we do. We, we provide forestry workshops and, and other uh, you know, educational opportunities, including one-on-one -on -one education of landowners as we work with them on the technical assistance. These are the counties that we're currently in. Uh, we hope to, in a few years, move on across the state. And uh, that's where we're at at the moment, 22 counties, but we started from four or five right around Charleston. I don't know if I jumped ahead of one. Yeah, uh, the impact slide, just basically when people want to know kind of, you know, what, what things we've been able to accomplish since we've started. Uh, from the legal legal arena, uh, we've cleared 301 titles to land with a cumulative tax assessed value of over $18 million. Uh, over 1,400 simple wills have been drafted at free, you know, drafted for free at community wills clinics. From the forestry side, uh, where I said we started with 40 families, we're now we've we've worked about over 500 families uh, at this point, and uh, they collectively own about 40,000 acres of land in, in South Carolina. I want to talk a little bit direct, directly about our forest services and what, and what we do for forestry and kind of the background I said in 2013 is when our forestry program actually started. And that was based on a, a couple factors, one of which uh, the statistics of the dramatic loss in African-American rural land uh, from a peak of about 15 million acres in 1910 down to a little over 2 million acres by the turn of this century. So dramatic loss of land and with it came a tremendous, you know, loss in rural wealth in those rural communities, uh, you know, just uh, losing that losing that land and income potential there. Um, and what Kind of the studies had shown that African American owned forest lands, they were not returning their potential value to the families. And a lot of that, uh, you know, some of that reason was behind the, 
the management of it that a lot of times African-American land was not being managed at the same intensity that uh, other private non-industrial landowners were managing their land for forestry. And, and as we got into it, I mean, you know, we have the stories of landowners that are being offered. Well, the one case that we, we talk about that happened early on, the uh, uh, landowner was offered $80,000 for timber. Her family actually owned over about 250 acres of land. So a large holdings for, for our landowners. But, um, you know, she, she got with our foresters. It ended up and we got them with a private consultant and, and the timber was worth almost $300,000. So that that's uh, maybe on the dramatic side, but we have that every day that, uh, you know, landowners just don't understand what their woods are worth or what the potential of their, their land is is worth. So, of course, education and providing technical assistance is important. Uh, let's see what's happening here. Got it. OK. Um, and, and I know it's about environmental justice and things like that. Kind of one, one case that we had, I'm not going to really delve in that. I'm just kind of talking. But one thing that comes up is um, the, the Pickford Glickman uh, discrimination case, uh, you know, class action lawsuit um, that was settled in 1999. Uh, basically, uh, you know, that black farmers had been discriminated against uh, by the USDA. And, and that's one case that, uh, you know, kind of changed things. And it also provided opportunities for us for some of the, the eventual funding that we've been able to use. Um, why, why forestry is a sustainable land use for our landowners? It's, it's a natural fit in South Carolina, uh, $21 billion economic impact in South Carolina, as Francis would say, um, you know, for our landowners, we tell them, you know, there's almost $500 million of wood uh, that's sold every year in South Carolina and their land's capable of being involved in that uh, if it's well managed and, and, you know, they have access to the markets, which is critical. Um, and, and this is just another slide that we show our landowners to let them know that why the potential for sustainable forest management is so important. And, and you know, it's, it's a natural fit. We have, you know, the wood using industry in South Carolina is tremendous. And um, of course, that's why people see so many of the logging trucks on the road. And how we accomplished our objectives in the forestry bucket, as we said, the land utilization bucket. Uh, one, awareness and forestry education, um, you know, forestry workshops, one on one with landowners, uh, just making them aware of the potential of their land and what it can do. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of what we do now is, you know, a lot of our landowners. And I would say most of our landowners are probably in the 25 to 30 acre, you know, size that they have. A lot of them are older, maybe 60s, 70s and 80s. Uh, often the, the, the kids who may be fairly, you know, middle aged themselves, but that they're disconnected a little bit from the land. So, so that's also a thing is, is education for, the new generation coming on and letting them know what the land is, trying to show that there's a financial incentive to, I mean, obviously there's, there's the heritage and, and things of the family land that's, that's been there. And, um, you know, the, the earlier generations went to a lot of effort to keep that land in the family. And, and we try to, you know, that's obviously hopefully impressed on them and then to show them that there's an initiative, in, in a, uh, there's a, I don't know if these are notes coming to me or not, but anyway, uh, that there's, um, you know, a reason and in, in financial incentive to keep that land in the family. And we also do uh, a big thing of what we're supposed to do is partner with the other agencies, which we do, and, um, and then pr pr provide technical assistance. I'm just going to show you a little bit, a uh, few slides just to show you what this looks like in, in reality. 
uh, the outreach and lander and landowner engagement. This is some of our foresters meeting with landowners. And, and, and honestly, the, the main thing that we do in our work is build trust, trust with landowners that, as we said, from that, from a lot of landowners distrust some uh, federal and state agencies, just past experience and things. Um, and, and it's building trust. And, uh, you know, that's a huge thing what we do and, and reaching out. We now have a, we have an outreach department actually that that's you know coordinates some of our seminars and things, but obviously foresters just being out there in in meeting with landowners is important. Uh, we provide educational materials like the ones shown on the screen, um, and um, anyway, ones such as selling timber off heirs' property is not a good idea because it can set you up for a lawsuit. Uh, many of you may know that. Uh, and we, we advise all landowners do not sell your land if it's an heir's property. Uh, but that does happen way too often. And, and a lot of times we're dealing with landowners who come to us. Their land was cut four or five, six years ago. They probably got very little for income from that. And it was left in a kind of degraded state. And, uh, you know, our hope is that we can um, most of our work uh, is done through the NRCS. Most of the funding right now is done through the NRCS and hopefully get their land back in a, in a, in a productive, healthy state. Educational events such as our forestry workshops that we hold. Um, connect to partners. As I said, that's that's critical to what we do. Um, we have uh, you know, like the Forestry Commission, obviously, the NRCS, South Carolina State, Clemson Extension, people. We work closely with them, Longleaf Alliance. Um, so the NRCS, I said, was one of the main um, agency source of funding that we have. They've been great to our program. Uh, having, we have a special funding pool for our landowners to help them access funds that we can regenerate their properties, get it back in a, in a productive state. Technical assistance. Uh, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one with landowners. And, and this is a, the thing that when the program really started, we didn't really see this component. I mean, obviously providing assistance, but our hope was that we'd be able to uh, connect our landowners to private forest consultants. Unfortunately, a lot of our, you know, our landowners have smaller uh, land holdings and it's difficult to get uh, private consultants. I mean, there's just not a lot of money to be made working with consultants, especially when they come into the come to us and their land's already been cut over. So uh, we've ended up doing a lot more technical assistance and, and you know, seeking grant grant funding and things to be able to, you know, increase the st our staff of, of foresters. The success success measures that we use. If they come to us with heirs property, that's the first thing we get them to our legal group and, and start working on resolving their titles. We want all our landowners to have a forest plan. So we try to get them to, all to have a forest management plan. Um, often this can be done, well, stewardship plans through the Forestry Commission or uh, forest management plans will be funded by the NRCS through the EQIP program. Uh, then we work with them on their forest practices and then uh, hopefully, down the road, they will be able to market uh, their timber on their tracks. And, you know, I talk all about forestry, but we understand that that all landowners, you know, it's not necessarily all forest land. So we work with landowners in, in any way possible uh, just to, to, you know, improve their land use. It, it may be open land that, that's better to try to lease to a, a farmer or you know, whatever it takes to help our landowners uh, use their land in a way that they can provide some income. I just stuck this in because you talked about urban forestry. I knew that was one of the topics. Uh, you know, we work in rural communities, but of course, rural communities become uh, populated at some point. This is a landowner we have that has 20 acres on Hilton Head Island, uh, you know, where it's situated and he's hard headed. Thank goodness for him, you know, and he's going to practice forestry there. Interesting when the 
the fire chief came and talked to him about uh, the prescribed burning wasn't going to be one of the practices they did there. But but uh, anyway, we do have landowners and, and we have a landowner in Kings Tree that owned, I think at one time her her family, her husband's family was sharecropping, you know, several hundred acres here that they ended up buying. And now it's it's down to, you know, about 28 acres as, uh, you know, they found themselves more and more in a in residential area with their land. Uh, I think one of the, the positive parts and outgrowth of our program is landowners like um, Joe Hamilton, who's the district tree farmer of the year. We're a strong supporter of the tree farm program. And this year we were thankful of last year, but actually awarded this year. Uh, Yvonne Knight Carter and her sister were, were, you know, became tree farmers of the year for their district. We're proud of that. Um, and just real quickly, what we provide, uh, we provide free forest services for both heirs property landowners and landowners that have clear title to their property. We mostly, I mean, we're working with historically underserved landowners, mostly African-American landowners. And, but just because the title heirs is in heirs properties in our, in our thing, we uh, work with people with clear title with clear title to their land. It's probably about half and half at, the, at this point, as far as our landowner. Um, we work with landowners owning 10 or more acres of land that's recognized as, by the Forestry Commission as the minimum size of a working forest. But uh, if landowners come to us with less, we, we obviously try to help them. There's no income criteria for our work. There is in the legal side, but no income criteria. And we, we just wanna make sure that the landowners we work with their intent is to keep the land in the family for generations to come, uh, not uh, helping them clean up their land so they can sell it. Um, and anyway, that's uh, something that we've done. Um, I will show you the map of how we're broken up. We have regions for each forester is assigned a region, which may be five to six or seven counties. And uh, we recently got a grant where we, we can extend our forestry uh, assistance uh, up into the Midlands, but we don't have legal assistance there yet or outreach. That's only uh, providing uh, limited forestry assistance in those, in those counties. And basically the, the bottom line is unlock the potential of your land. And um, that's kind of what we do. And, and I appreciate the chance to uh, talk to y'all today. And I don't know that I can hear, maybe I should check the, um, box, but anyway, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. No, stop sharing. Perfect. Can everyone hear me? If you could just, if you can't hear me, write it in the chat box. How's that? Um, super. Thank you, Francis. Um, thank you so much, Steve. I just wanted to provide a little bit of context. I know that you guys probably jumped on this webinar saying like, oh, it was supposed to be all urban, but we do want to talk about urban and community forests. And, you know, smaller landholders are a big part of community forestry. So we just kind of wanted to tell you why we did that. Um, and I really wanted to say thank you to Steve for, for going through that presentation. Thank you for the work that Steve does, and we really appreciate him sharing what he's doing. Now, what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to ask Keisha to turn on her screen sharing and hers and her screen, which she's done perfect, and I'm going to get off. <laughs> Here we go. Give me just one second. Okay. There we go. Thank you, Keisha. All right. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Hopefully you can see me because I can't see myself. We can't okay. see you. Yeah, we can't see you, but um, let's just make sure the screen sharing does work. All right. How's that? See something. Perfect. Yep. It looks like we can see the crowdcast screen and now we can see your desktop. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to go Perfect. ahead and talk. 
All right. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I am Keisha Long. I am the Environmental Justice Coordinator at South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. And I also have a new computer set up. So that's probably what's going on with, I had a little bit of technical difficulties and probably why, can you see me now? I see a little light. Christine. We see you. Yep. Okay. We see you. <laughs> so please excuse me. It's just, it's just a mess and I hate changing computers. Okay. <laughs> So uh, my background actually is in engineering. I have a degree in civil engineering. I started out right out of college at DHEC, actually, but I was a project manager in the Superfund program, which is a hazardous waste cleanup program. And I did that for many, many years before becoming a, the environmental justice coordinator. So just to get our feet, our bearings, DHEC is a large agency. It has thousands of employees. We are one of three agencies in the country that have combined public health and environmental health mandates. So I work on what we call the environmental affairs side. Myra Reese is the director. And her priorities include, as you can see on the slide, partnerships, community engagement, and environmental justice. We have five bureaus who are responsible for issuing permits, doing cleanups, compliance inspections. And those five bureaus are Bureau of Air Quality, Bureau of Land and Waste Management, where I used to sit as a um, engineer, Bureau of Water, the Ocean and Coastal Resource Management Group. They are along the coast, the Atlantic coast. They have special responsibilities because of being right there on the ocean. And then Bureau of Environmental Health Services houses our regional offices. We have uh, four regions with eight different offices throughout the state. The main office is in Columbia, the center. And we also have an environmental lab that tests for things such as uh, soil samples, milk samples, ice cream, radiological samples. So we do the whole gamut and they're certified by the EPA. So we get a lot a, of complaints. I could call DHEC the agency of last resort because if there's a problem, people tend to call DHEC or other agencies refer callers to DHEC. Um, last week, I looked at our main call log metrics. And as of today, or last week, excuse me, there were over 27,000 phone calls that were answered by our front desk. And that's just the front desk, the one number. That's not including the, the regional offices. And that uh, is a running number. It's not quite a year, um, August of last year to um, last week. So not quite a year, over 27,000 phone calls. They run the gamut, uh, sewage on property. That is something that DHEC uh, has some regulatory authority over, but uh, something like sinkholes, not so much, uh, mud on roadways, no, but we're required to respond to all complaints. So, excuse me, we do have now a chat bot where instead of calling, you can go onto our website and um, type in your question. And there's a really good um, way to either get your question answered or find the correct person to talk to, as opposed to having to spend many, many hours finding the right person to talk to. So let's get into what is justice. And this is a graphic I really like to show in all my presentations. I think it's a good graphical presentation of equality, equity, and justice. So there are three people 
watching a soccer game. The first picture, the three people are all standing on a box behind a wood fence. The box are, boxes are the same size, same color, same shape. And you can see the person, the third person, can't see the game because they're too short. So we move to the middle picture where we have equity. And this is where everyone gets the supports that they need. Everybody can see the game. However, you notice that the first person no longer has a box. And I am going to make an assumption that his box was taken away and given to the shorter person which is as a human uh, instinct, we don't like things taken away from us, even if it's something we don't need. So let's move to the third graphic, which is justice. And the cause of the inequity has been addressed. So the wood fence has been replaced with a see-through fence. Everyone can see the game without accommodations or supports. And I like to joke that the fence is still there because when I was in super fun, if we found a pollution problem that we needed to address immediately, first thing we did put up was a fence. But if you Google this particular um, concept, oftentimes you will see no fence in, in the justice frame. So what is environmental justice? The definition was created by the EPA in the 1990s, and it states that the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of people of all races, cultures, and income with respect to the development, adoption, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies, everyone has to be included, everyone has to be involved in whatever government function um, we work on as at DHEC. I would like to point out that environmental justice, the actual concept was, is part of an executive order, presidential executive order that was issued in 1994. It applies not only to the Environmental Protection Agency or to DHEC, but to all federal agencies. And so you may have seen on the news, different agencies such as housing or transportation Homeland Security Justice, um, discussing environmental justice uh, as part of the executive order, not only EPA, but all federal agencies are required to follow this definition. And as you can see, there's a few words at the end that says, in working towards increasing prosperity of all South Carolinians, that is a phrase that was added by the South Carolina General Assembly in 2007. So this is also another graphic I like to show. And I got this over 20 years ago from a colleague. And I admired it when I was still in Superfund because it's a good representation of what I did as a Superfund project manager. But it also is a good representation of what I do now as environmental justice coordinator. So at the top right corner, there is a dump that is on fire. And there's a secondary hazard going on with the water flowing over the trash into a pond. There are firefighters there responding to this particular fire. And the water presumably is coming from their efforts as well as um, potentially I see a, a creek that seems to be close by. This is a, a real concept. I've actually worked on a couple of um, trash fires and they're hard to put out. At the bottom, there's another landfill, but it is not on fire, thankfully. There are workers covering the open garbage with a um, what we call a containment cap so that the natural rain, when it hits that cap and eventually the garbage, it uh, actually washes away and it doesn't leach into the ground. Since it's still a little bit open, you can see the, the dark gray that is 
leachate or garbage juice that is getting into the water aquifer. There is a cleanup strategy for this particular landfill. So you see the pipe is a pump and treat, is pumping out the contamination, treating it through uh, probably a carbon filter and discharging into a duck pond. And then in the very middle at the bottom, there's an old factory that has some drums. The trees are dead, the grass is dead, and there's a, a cesspool lagoon there. With the liner, so it, it's not leaching into the groundwater, but it is something that the people responding to it are using a vacuum truck to um, suck it out. So I have had all three of these particular projects, but not at the same time, because these are all multi-million dollar projects, lots of engineering specs, lots of field work. Um, so let's say I'm working on the, the drum dump, Lucas is working on the old landfill, and Angie's working on the fire. We may not all be in the same group. We might be in a different bureau. I show you have five bureaus. We might not even be at the same agency. Uh, EPA also um, works on major cleanups. So I consider the part on the right this of this poster to be environmental justice community because you see multiple houses. There's a playground across from the, the, the trash dump fire multiple stressors in a small space to adhere to the fair treatment and meaningful involvement piece um we're required to have public notices and meetings to engage with the community but if we have three different people doing three different things at three different times that's a lot on one community to keep up with it's a lot for me to keep up with um, as a project manager that's in the middle of all of this. Also, the placement of these facilities, we have zoning laws. It's not random. So it's likely that um, these facilities were planned. And that touches on the fair treatment part, part of environmental justice. Okay, I wanted to loop in a few um, tree-related things. I also am part of a uh, group called the ITRC. We are a state-led or state-led organization that works on cleanup technologies and processes, and have been for over 25 years. Um, this is just one of the products that uh, ITRC published many years ago. It's phytoremediation. Uh, as I showed on the previous slide, there was a, a pump and treat system cleaning groundwater. That is considered an old technology. Um, phytoremediation is a potential natural technology where um, you plant certain trees, they uptake the contamination, process it through their um, leaves and roots and then actually is cleaning up the groundwater and what is being um, discharged into the air are oxygen and, and non-toxic um, chemicals. So uh, I put the, the link there. You can go and look at these technical documents and um, I know the previous um, presentation, uh, there was a lot about cutting of trees and or what I could, could hear when I was having my technical difficulties. But there's also the concept of planting trees, not only to um, beautify and create oxygen, but also to clean up properties. There, there's definitely that possibility. Now, with uh, on the right, there's a picture, a logo of brownfields, and that's the concept of taking lands that are contaminated or perceived to be contaminated, putting uh, money into it and redeveloping it so that 
the land is back on the tax rolls, provides green spaces or jobs or what have you, depending on where it is. And so we do have a Brownfields program, um, very good uh, loan uh, standards. If you're interested in that, it's a one interest, one year interest only, 10 year repayment, 1% interest rate. You can get a 30% loan forgiveness up to $200,000 for nonprofits. So I encourage you to um, type in Brownfields DHEC and, and see the possibilities for either uh, low interest loans or and there are also grants available for cleanups and redevelopment. This is the logo for environmental justice here at DHEC. We have five um, guiding principles. And the reason why we have this is because there's no environmental justice law in the state of South Carolina. So going back to one of the first slides, collaborative partnerships, uh, environmental justice, and um, other collaborative processes are priorities because in order to adhere to environmental justice principles, we have to work with the community, with other state agencies, with private industry, and also with um, commercial interests. So here we have the five concepts of environmental justice at DHEC, starting with the three people in the circle. So we are to ensure that environmental justice communities are meaningfully involved and routinely considered throughout our decision-making processes. So that's basically the environmental justice definition in a nutshell. Moving clockwise, we are to proactively promote partnerships between communities and other stakeholders. We actively encourage capacity building and collaborative problem solving within environmental justice communities. We share technical assistance and identify resources. And we are strengthening our agency's leadership with the goal of sustaining environmental justice within DHEC. And that's a very important concept because we have over a thousand staff members working on our environmental um, side of DHEC. When I was a project manager, I had about 30 to 40 projects. So that's tens of thousands of permits, cleanup actions, letters that are going out every year. And we have one environmental justice coordinator. So that means every staff member, every manager has to have a environmental justice lens on when they're looking at their different applications, um, inspections, um, doing field visits, etc. for this to actually work. I did want to highlight some of our collaborative partnerships. This uh, is showing four pilot communities that we worked with in 2009. We were fortunate enough to get a grant from the EPA to do some capacity building. The four were on the Imani Group out of Aiken, the CDIC, which is uh, in Graniteville area. If you remember several years ago, there was a train that derailed and released chlorine um, in the community. Uh, about nine, nine to 11 people died and also the chlorine corroded a lot of the infrastructure in the area. A Place for Hope is in Rock Hill. Um, they were, they have very thick clays and were having trouble um, getting clean water and they were somewhat isolated. So the city at the time decided not to extend the water lines. Um, so this is a picture of a, a water house that was um, brought in to, as a stopgap before um, this eventually, hopefully, they will get um, water lines. And then uh, Lampsey, that's Low Country Alliance for Model Communities in North Charleston. They're a conglomerate of seven different neighborhoods. And they work on environmental justice, revitalization, affordable housing, 
um, they helped us with some COVID response. This is a, a food drive, so they have many different initiatives. And as part of that different project, they um, issued a workbook for environmental justice communities to catalog the efforts in, in order to pay it forward and help other communities who are starting from scratch just see some lessons learned and um, some ideas of what environmental justice communities can do to help uh, redevelop and revitalize. This is our current grant efforts. Uh, it's called EJ Strong. We are focusing on responding to disasters. So we have held two workshops on disaster preparedness and planning. We plan to hold two more uh, in the future. So we're really focusing on community managed disaster response as opposed to the emergency managers, uh, professional emergency managers that work on these things every day. Oftentimes when the say a hurricane is coming through, we can see on television the professionals issuing orders basically to do this, do that, evacuate. Um, but if you don't have a car, how do you evacuate? Um, if you do evacuate and then come back and your house is flooded, what do you do? How do you rebuild? Do you rebuild? Can you rebuild? So this project is intended to step through all of these scenario scenarios and try to plan so when something does happen, everyone is better prepared. So resilience and environmental justice community, capacity building, um, thinking ahead before something happens. LAMPSI is our nonprofit that we're working with. They are near the Port of Charleston. Their I-26 runs through the area. There are factories that emit ethylene oxide and other chemicals that are uh, of concern. And there are several Superfund sites in the area. I've worked on at least four in this small area. So they are an environmental justice community. They are concerned about potential secondary releases. If, let's say, a hurricane comes through and the power goes out, um, can the, the facilities do to have backup power, whether it be a secondary release? Uh, I showed you a picture of the landfill fire. There was a secondary release with the water going over the trash. Uh, that is a real concern. So again, uh, empowerment for planning, responding, and rebuilding um, for disasters. And this is an essential pilot for the region and the country. We intend to take our work and develop it into webinars so that we can share it with the country and throughout the world. So some take home messages, if you've heard absolutely nothing, please pay attention to this one slide. And it's um, the definition of environmental justice, which is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of people of all races, cultures, and income. Fair treatment and meaningful involvement are the key phrases for the definition. And also collaborative partnerships. If you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. So as environmental justice coordinator here at DHEC, that is something I try to adhere to. And that is the end of my presentation. This is my contact information slide. So my office, as well as my cell phone number and my email, I am located on Bull Street in Columbia. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Keisha. We appreciate it. I'm just going to open up the presentation one more time. And um, I... If you all could, before you log off in the presentation, if you could take a look at the polls and just answer those for us. I also wanted to open it up. Does anyone have any questions or comments they wanted to make 
Um, I took a look in the ask a question section and didn't see anything right away, but before our speakers log off, I wanted to go ahead and reach out and see if anyone had anything they wanted to talk about. If no, uh, thank you everyone again. We really appreciate it. If you have any feedback for us, please, please, please reach out to us. If you need, um, if you need credits, again, the S, the Planners Commissioner's credits, email me your name and I'll get you your certificate. If you need ISA, Arborist credits, your ISA number and your name. And then if you need planners credits and don't know how to get them, feel free to reach out to me. I can send you directly to the AICP page where this event is housed. Again, I, I really thank you guys for logging on. We hope everyone has a great day and we hope we see you guys back in September for the next one.